Yeah, who will make it? Ah, okay, so recording now. Okay, so I will start uh, and I will try to explain what I did. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, uh, we had discussion about uh, historical data sets, about Spanish flu. And uh, actually, I've created parser to uh, harvest all stuff from uh, a royal uh, Dutch Royal Library. So now I have like 70,000 uh, articles about Spanish flu in one data set. And also uh, I started to uh, create transcripts with author AI, transcripts of movies about, uh, actually documentaries about uh, Black Death and uh, Spanish flu. So now you can find really nice data sets in, in Dataverse and uh, yeah, I will put link now and uh, it's now kind of branded. So you can see the different containers for different uh, pandemics. Yeah, look. And uh, I think it's a good start for us because I already had discussions with a few people. And uh, for example, Ishan is going to uh, recognize, uh, to detect all languages because obviously uh, in this library, uh, from where I've got all the information, uh, they have uh, newspapers in different languages and mostly in Dutch, but probably like 25% in English from the United States, from Great Britain, wherever. So he's going to detect languages and uh, uh, he promised me to send some update today, probably tonight. And also uh, it's a very important task because uh, every news article basically contains a lot of other information and uh, uh, something about influenza will, will be probably one snippet. It's like probably like two, three sentences, how it goes somewhere in the world or in, in Netherlands. So we need to actually to create algorithm to, uh, to be able to extract those snippets and to create uh, another data set of, out of it. And uh, this is quite, I think, a challenge because uh, sometimes uh, the structure of newspaper is not clear, of news article and uh, it can be written somewhere in, inside of the text for one sentence or two. And uh, sometimes it can be like a uh, large article about what's happened and uh, also how it goes. So um, it should be really flexible ag algorithm to extract those snippets. And I think there is clearly a task for artificial intelligence. So we need to create model and uh, we need probably to train uh, these new entities because uh, we are operating with historical texts. So probably we have different, uh, even different words <laughs> describing the uh, pandemic. So this is where we, we should be creative and uh, actually to uh, use machine learning, I think. So also for uh, transcripts of movies uh, because there are like, like uh, quite quite a lot of evidences of uh, people that used to live in that time already translated of course from latin and whatever language from french or what they used uh, and uh, we we should be able also to uh, get all these evidences and to create data set out of it so this is kind of initial plan and if we'll manage to get to this point we also uh, should think how actually to build a machine learning model to get uh, all, um, let's say, uh, quantitative data uh, about some total cases or so like, like how many people died, they thought, and uh, this kind of information, this kind of data should create uh, new data sets that, that will extract from historical sources. So it's kind of next step what we should do. So I'm wondering if you have questions or comments about that. Uh, by the way, when you were speaking about uh, different structures of articles uh, of Spanish flu, is there a way to create like uh, additional subtask? So is there a way to group the structure of those articles 
to transform this task uh, into like simpler ones. So to, for example, to transform it or to scrape the data from the articles in this format, in format A, in format B, in format C, and so on. So basically format is already standardized and uh, it's a JSON. And in, in this JSON, it's uh, more or less corresponding to Core 19. So we have a um, title of a um, newspaper article. We have basically a name of journal or newspaper title. And uh, we have date of publication. Uh, I think we have some, some extra um, metadata fields. I don't remember exactly, but it seems to be not, not very important for us. But anyway, uh, it's a JSON and uh, it's like full text. So it, it can be, let's say, uh, one page A4, but, but uh, relevant information can be only in few sentences. Something like that. Like that. Okay. So this is why I'm actually thinking about uh, uh, building machine, new machine models, uh, machine learning models to uh, extract this information from uh, mm -hmm. our So, like I already said, there are people that are already busy uh, this task, and uh, Pranjali already uh, created Elastic Search Index on, on all articles, and uh, in, yeah, it's available on Slack. And uh, currently, he's busy with update uh, of uh, seventy thousand, and probably it, it will be all, all already available today. And uh, uh, yeah, Ishan probably will, will finish um, detection of languages. So we'll get understanding of what we actually have and from which sources. And um, yeah, we can do some, some further investigation. And of course, I'm looking for other sources because I started from Netherlands and I also have uh, uh, API from Belgium to query uh, news articles. And uh, it would be nice to have something from British Library and already... Yeah, the, I was going to say the British Archives is probably a good place to reach out to, but I don't know how publicly facing some of their data sets are. Uh, well, uh, what, I, what I already discovered, there is a really nice archive uh, from British uh, Royal Library and uh, they have about 3 million um, articles. And uh, you can actually open <laughs> three articles for free, full text. And after you should pay like eight uh, ninety-five pounds per month or something to get access access to uh, other articles. So uh, sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> a kind of strange business models model because uh, well, you can just pay. Uh, nine pounds and uh, yeah, you can harvest whatever you want. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know, know if there's limitations on it. Yeah, um, probably they have some limitations, but I don't know. It's uh, I, won't, I won't mind, but I was at a talk recently about social history and like recent social history and using machine learning and machine data science to, to be able to um, better do, you know, evaluate history through a more um, method, methodology, you know, methodology sound process. Um, I'll see if I can reach out to some of the researchers that were involved in that because they might have some thoughts. I had some links to what, um, yeah, there was some social history stuff. It was basically around, they were basically there studying around the end of the Victorian era up to about, nine, I think it's like 1850 to 1925, which is right within the area we're looking at anyway, if we're going to look at 19, uh, 1990. Yeah. As, as the most prominent prominent one, and they're talking about they're studying all this um, the language in the language that's used in newspapers so um, I'll find some links on it and I'll because I watched a talk from a woman who runs it from the for the British Library um, it seems like a really interesting thing now it's just coincidentally because I watched it about a, a month maybe ago I'll see what I, I've got I saved the links because it seemed like a really interesting thing. Now it's become obviously slightly more relevant because we're doing some more history. I'm a bit of a history nerd. I watch a lot of history and read a lot of history stuff anyway. Um, so yeah, I'll find some. I'll dig out some links and see if it can give us some uh, researchers to reach out to or some 
points of uh, points of view for data sets. Because I used to do some research. Um, I used to do research searching for people in here. So I know we're a bit around some of the archives. But, um, not as far back as 18, 1918. I didn't generally go that far back. That's not completely true. Searches, but we're further back. But yeah, a lot of it's kind of price gated and, and money, and there's sort of some money. There's, about, there's uh, price barriers in front of it. So we'll see if we can work around some of them. If we can make contact with some academic researchers inside the library, they might give us an avenue in as a way. Well, I'll throw some links up. I really, I really think that uh, they can, uh, they could be interested in uh, what we're doing because if we'll manage to get some snippets, uh, these uh, relevant uh, fragments, uh, mentioning something about influenza and like symptoms and this kind of stuff, so it's kind of relevant. So if you'll think about uh, comparison of what's going on with COVID nineteen, all these patterns and uh, uh, influenza, like with Spanish flu. I think it's, it can be quite, quite relevant uh, work for them as well to investigate. Yeah. This is what uh, economic, uh, economic historians usually do, right? So they're trying to find some patterns and to get some explanation of uh, current events <laughs> based on historical uh, things. Are we, are we only going back um, as far as 1918 or further? Because No, no, no. So um, uh, we started with uh, 1918, and after uh, we just we, we were just coming deeply to Middle Ages, so to Black Death uh, pandemic actually. Mm, yeah, like you mentioned that. Then it would be good to. If, I'm just wondering if we can get sources that have been, I guess, translated or transcribed into modern English, um, or any kind of modern language because I would just expect that doing something like entity recognition on, <laughs> on the original text will be, will be quite hard. Yes, this is exactly my idea. And uh, it was the reason why I started with documentaries, because usually you can recognize names of uh, people, of researchers that are already working on it. And also uh, there are some nice uh, references also, like they mentioned in source from where they got it. And uh, of course, it's translated to modern English. So we basically have all components that we can compile in order to get something interesting. So my idea, after we'll get uh, all these uh, named entry recognition pipelines working on um, transcripts, probably we can actually approach uh, people that uh, got mentioned in both videos and uh, we can ask them for collaboration also. Yeah, cool. And then when you say snippets, the, so nearest this would just be basically single words, right? So you, you imagine that we just get interesting items and then those are in sentences that, that are hopefully relevant and then those sentences we share? Yeah. So basically, I, I want uh, to put every sentence like that uh, uh, into the kernel and uh, the kana is excellent annotation tool that uh, mm -hmm. our can yeah. reuse and they can create new labels and this is how we we, we can get uh, to uh, new models for machine models or uh, machine learning well, what kind of labels do you want to put on the sentences well uh, I don't know yet. I, I just want to see it. Uh, so until we'll get to this stage and after we'll actually ask uh, researchers because uh, obviously we need some guidance how to continue. So we are kind of, you know, like, like doing experimental stuff and we are coming to the point where like professional researchers that spent like part of their life already on doing this kind of research, they can tell us uh, what they do and how they, they can actually benefit from work that uh, we are doing, right? So it can be really a valuable input for us and we can continue to do something in this way. Yeah, yeah, agree. I was just wondering if there's already a sense of, what, because annotation can mean different things, right? It could be word level annotations, could be um, 
um, periods within a sentence, right? So like snippets or the entire sentence. But yeah, it makes makes perfect sense to pass it by by researchers. Yeah. So basically, the task is yeah. to do near on on these data sets that are in um, Elastic, right? Yeah, I even it's think different different kind uh, type of research. It can be even different annotation because. For example, if you have uh, people uh, doing research like in social sciences, obviously will be interested in like social impact. You know, there is pandemic and something happening and uh, how people feeling and uh, feel, feel about all these events. And from other side, uh, if we have people interested in economic uh, research, so they're basically in, in uh, numbers. So they're interested to collect all these numbers to create kind of, you know, spreadsheet and to do analysis in this way. So uh, we need actually to approach both groups and create annotations for uh, every group separately. And probably we, we can even get people from their groups to do that. Cool. Um, do we already have, um, because I'm, I'm not on the latest as to what pipelines we've set up, but you mentioned in our call that um, like we have NLP pipelines that are based on brand and stuff. Yep. So do we have, can we just reuse them? And well, obviously tweak them, but is there code that we can just build on? Yeah, so, so uh, we will use it as a kind of baseline. And the idea that uh, obviously we need to create custom models. And yesterday we had to call these uh, uh, task ties and they're already building the custom models. So we, we, we just need to create a process that will allow to read all this custom stuff into uh, our pipeline and to get new, new uh, entities recognized. Okay. So, so if, if it will become a reusable process, I don't see any problems for other groups just, and other teams just, just to reuse the same pipeline, but with their own stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I found this project is called Living with Machines. It's studying the impacts of technology during the, on ordinary people during the Industrial Revolution. Oh, yeah. Now, so they're basically already doing the same sort of thing. But rather than looking at the impact of an illness, they're looking at the impacts of technology and discussions around technology using machine learning and AI technology. So what they're already doing, we're interested in doing with a slightly different dimension. I definitely mm -hmm. feel like there's some interesting crossover there. Yeah. Uh, and can, can you share links up. Yeah, the link on Slack as well? Yeah, I'm going to do. I'm going to do it there because there's no point sharing it here and then having to copy it. Okay. Great. Yeah, I watched a talk with the the lead on it, Miss uh, Dr. Mia Ridge. Ah, Mia. Yeah. Okay. Mia yeah. Ridge. Yeah, really interesting lady. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know. Um, fair enough. Dr. Mia Ridge seems like an interesting person we could reach out to or at least okay. Okay. find out what they're doing and, and find that crossover point because they're using, you know, machine learning and tech, machine learning and data, data led technologies to better understand, um, you know, cultural, cultural influences of technology and, and cultural in, in, in interpretations of it. So I get there's a massive crossover, absolutely okay. a massive crossover. Anyways, have fun with that. I'll leave you two guys to do the hard work. I'll just occasionally throw my interesting things that I find. Okay. How the hell do you know Mia Ridge? How does that? How is? How is that even a thing? Like... Yeah, well, but I, I well, um, I don't remember if I told you or. So, I'm I'm working in this field for almost a decade, and uh, I participated in a lot of projects. Like I had like more than ten really big European infrastructures, and uh, well, I know a lot of people also. So yeah, she's well, she's working on. I think they're also connecting up with some citizen scientists and that sort of stuff. And obviously, by yeah, some yeah. extension, we're kind of a citizen scientist group with real scientists in the mix. So <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I'm not a real scientist by any no. by, not by any measure of it. <laughs> okay guys so um do you have any questions about what we do um, uh, what's like what's first steps or what's next steps 
because we've already, like I say, you've got some, um, you've already tried to make custom models and ties. Are we going to be just basically reusing and editing started in ties or are they completely different and roughly if you start from scratch um you've started to, i see you started to pull data sets in but what other data would we need these are our top 10 things we need to find to try and search because yes uh, newspapers is going to be a good resource but you know is mm -hmm. the, are, are there other resources and other data sources that will be useful and also how can we get around some of the technological Yes, and if we and if we have to pay nine pounds, but we can download the entire entirety, we can't download the entire. We don't have enough data because I, I, she was talking about the fact that there's a one of the British libraries is literally outside of the city I live in. It's up in um, Harrogate. It's mm -hmm. it's a massive site with twenty million books or two hundred million books or some stupid amount and journals and terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of digitized versions of it and that's only one of two sites that are like that plus the one of the national archives in birmingham which is, i've had researchers going in there for me before so there's we're not going to be able to take it all there's just too much so we need to work out where we need to what's going to be useful for us that's that's yeah, important because yeah. otherwise you know <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna overload ourselves in in a very short window um yeah, but, but uh, I, 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 think, I think at Corona Way, we we're just kind of creating uh, experimental processes. So like process to do uh, entity extraction, right? And if we'll see interest from uh, other groups or, you know, as stakeholders just coming to us, so we, we can just uh, start to do processing for their own sources. So if they'll bring 20 millions of books to us, so let's do it. Why, why not? I don't see any limitations. So as long as we've, I mean, I know we've got infrastructure and I don't know fully how it's all been paid for and how much of it we're using and if what, what limits we have, because I know theoretically there must be limits. We haven't run into them yet, but yes. you know, nothing's unlimited. But you're the one who's dealing with a lot of the technology stuff. And I'd love to learn more about it, but I'm, you know, we're all doing so many different things in so many different places. We can't do it all. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just kind of, trying to think of the feasibility and the practical side of it as well. It's like, okay, yeah, it's all right saying that, but if we had 20 million books, can we store 20 million books and then process 20 million books? And if mm -hmm. we process 20 million books, how big is the processing time going to be? Does it, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of like some of the practical problems that we're going to bump into before we try and get there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So are the, are the researchers guiding us and what literature to select? Are they kind of giving us prior knowledge on like, hey, this is what we should um, yeah. invest in? We need okay. to reach out to some researchers to give us some. Uh, yeah, I, I can uh, respond to this question because um, I got approached by a group from Amsterdam and uh, they're already uh, sharing links that uh, we should use and also sources. And uh, some interesting data sets like uh, there is a data set with all professions and uh, like with historical codes. So uh, obviously we, we need to train model to recognize all uh, pieces in the text uh, mentioned in some professions as a further steps, right? And uh, I don't know, we will see what will happen because it's quite, quite, a, quite a challenge for us. And uh, of course it's, it's uh, experimental and uh, we'll see how it, it will evolve in time. Yeah, cool. Uh, and just, Another technical question because I'm catching myself up. Do you just like, well, multiple pipelines? Are these actually are they part of the infrastructure now, or are they still in notebooks and and that's? No, it? no, it's 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 just a separate um, infrastructure piece that you can just run a, a from Docker. Okay. So, uh, I think I already shared the uh, latest version. If not, I, I will just send you update. So basically we have a Docker image with all uh, models. And uh, now the idea that uh, we'll create uh, with Amazon AWS, we'll create template and we'll just basically start it, start it on demand. So it, it will just deploy a virtual machine with uh, amount of nodes and, uh, okay, gotcha. and uh, after we'll just, just start process and it will get a data set from Dataverse downloaded and uh, after process will be finished we'll just stop it so this is the most efficient way how we can uh, yeah. 
we, we, we can do it more or less in like economic way, <laughs> not to burn all credits that we already got. Cool. Yeah, if you have an overview or like that, just share it with me. That would that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And by the way, uh, customized models also uh, will fit very well in this picture because we, uh, it should be part of uh, this template. If you want to add like, like extra models, you should be able to select from different uh, tasks and uh, it will just uh, download all models inside of uh, pipeline and will execute. So it should, should be very simple. Nice, cool. Um, I think I'm good as to, I don't have any more questions, I think. Okay, great. Anyone else? High level, anyways. <laughs> yeah, I've just found the GitHub for Living with Machines, the collaboration for linguists, curators, and data scientists. Okay. Might be some interest. There might be some interesting things to dig through in there. I'm like anticipating much more high-level code-related things that you guys can look at than mm -hmm. me guessing my way through. <laughs> Okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, because it's got about um, repositories about assessing optical, char optical, optical character recognition with downstream NLP tasks. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to be using optical, I don't know if we're going to be using like scans or, you know, but that's all questions we're going to bump into as we start thinking about this, which is why I'd rather reuse somebody else's clever idea than having to build. Mm -hmm. for, by the way, for optical recognition, uh, we have a really good tool. Um, it's called uh, Transcribus, and it was developed in, in Netherlands, and after it went to Austria. So now uh, it's available as a tool that you can, desktop tool that you can install on your uh, computer, and you can do um, optical recognition with medieval, even handwritten medieval texts. So it uses some kind of deep learning and, uh, well, I would say it can produce pretty well quality, uh, pretty good quality already. Of course, it's not 100% accurate, but at least you can get some, something out of it. So, yeah. I, so I have to I have to balance now, unfortunately. Um, Slava, are you gonna put down tasks, um, or who's gonna who's gonna do that? Chop it up and, and assign. Well, let's keep in con uh, let's stay in in contact and. Uh, yeah, I think keep it in loop. We, um, I don't know. We as a general rule, we don't generally have someone sitting down and dividing tasks. It's a case of if you can if you can come up with something, or if you feel like that's a good step take it on, work on yeah. it, let people know that you're working on it. We don't, we're very like decentralized. There's no, I'm going to tell you what to do. It's more like, I feel like this is an answer. And then we'll go, go work it out then. Great. You see what you can do. Ask for help where you need to reach out to me if you need more people or if you need more, you know, if there's resources you need or something and I'll see if I can find more people to problem. Sure. Or if we, um, how are we doing on computing power and credits? Are we, Sustainable on that front right now, or are we going to have to start like cap in hand asking for some more from people? Well, we will definitely need to ask for some more, but to, to kick start this, I think we're good to go. Cool. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just here to try and make sure the practical stuff solved. You guys are the ones that do the data science, constantly trying to work it out myself. I've got so many books to read that I'm going to get around to at some point just to even understand some of the comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, no more questions. Um, yeah. We're done then. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks to you. Um, yeah. I have to come up with some sort of framework of what, yeah what sort of problems need solving. And it, I think it's finding data is obviously, you've said we've got a chunk of data from mm -hmm. one dimensional. Um, language is gonna start being a problem as well, and it like tran literally translation sense, like different 
actual languages. Yeah. We're going to get a better picture. We're going to need to start looking at what the people, Germany, what the people in Germany were saying, what people in Spain were saying, what people in America were saying. You know, they're not all going to be the same, but they're going to the patterns are going to hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a actually, actually, uh, it can be different. You know, because uh, we're talking about uh, like First World War, and uh, if you think uh, it was actually forbidden to. Uh, published oh, yeah, yeah Britain yeah Britain well that's one of the reasons why I was literally reading about it earlier on just because I was curious it was called the Spanish flu because the censors of Britain, Britain and American censors and like allied censors were basically um, talk like not having published information about how bad the, the spread was and the, well, that's one of the reasons why it was called the Spanish flu mm -hmm. Spain was neutral and because Spain was neutral was uh, in, like since it was a neutral country, and because it was a neutral country, reporting on them wasn't like ignored as like vilification of the other side, but it also wasn't talking about like allies and undermining their censorship that's happening. And I find mm -hmm. that really interesting. It's a really interesting point, and it does kind of go to some of the discussion points we've had about how Germany is defining deaths and labeling things and. Mm -hmm. Is it censorship or is it just like how you frame and how you label things and how like supposedly China has been massaging the numbers and like potentially down either downplaying the case counts or downplaying the deaths or and and it goes into the even though we're not in a world war scenario, it shows you that the human instinct is to manage the narrative and the story around it and it's not completely truthful and it is. Mm -hmm going to be a problem to try and find the facts but at the same time we're going to get an interesting sentiment and because it'll you know it'll inform people are still people like people 100 years ago and people now have got very much the same kind of flaws and the same kind of patterns and yeah they might be talking in rather than talking about going and watching live music they're talking about an ipod but the sent you know the 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 patterns of human behavior are still very mm -hmm. yeah i agree completely there's less i mean the, there's going to be a difference between that and how people talk about the black death partially because of lack of literacy and lots of other things but there probably will still be similar patterns where the powerful of this the power of the state will try and downplay it or try and manage the opinion of it and yeah that's still going to exist so it's going to be an, it's going to be an interesting discovery I'm, I'm looking forward to finding out what we can build so other people can tell me interesting stories you know just to give you an example how actually different nation nations see the same events so like uh, when it was black death times so uh, i watched a documentary uh, actually it was british documentary and uh, Next day, I watched French documentary about the same, and uh, actually, British um, people blamed uh, French because uh, you know they got wine from France, and uh, also French people coming by ships and uh, bringing this stuff. So this is how actually the pandemic started in, in Great Britain <laughs> in most times. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, there's some truth in the sense that there ain't no. There is no black death from Europe without ships from Europe to carry the things that are carrying. Yeah, exactly. the, the, it's absolutely true, but it's not like flat, anyone in France planned it. It's just the nature of a pandemic. <laughs> it, it will spread given the opportunity. And if it's on the back of a, you know, a, a rat or in the air floating around, coughed it out, it will spread. It's literally the purpose of the virus is to multiply itself. It's its only goal in I can't really use the word life, but it is literally its only mission is to just make more. So, yeah, that's, that's all it does. It's got no grand plan. It's got no political ideology. It's literally make more of me, and that's all it tries to do. But it's so annoying when people try and politicize something that is trying to kill everyone and doing it like it doesn't care. It doesn't go, oh, well, I'll stay at this border or this fictional region of the world. Yeah, we'll just go everywhere that people are. Stop thinking of it in such a simplistic counts of certain areas. I mean, it gives us information, but it's just... Uh, 
no. It's measured in a French village or a German village and they're 10 miles apart from each other. Absolutely makes no difference. The, the virus does not care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, let's finish. And uh, yeah, so hopefully until next time, we will get something practical done. Cool. Cheers for your call, guys. Cheers for hanging out. Nice to see you. Now you missed, nice to meet you, Bodan. Yeah, that's right. Bodan? Yeah, Bodan. nice to meet you too, Tyler. Don't forget to, um, have you downloaded it? Are you recording it to your computer or is? Uh, yeah, I'm recording and I was thinking, so maybe I do not have an access to the Corona Y channel, so uh, which I can upload this to Google Drive and provide. Yeah, just take it on a Google Drive and I'll upload it from there. If that's that's fine, I'll do it that way. Okay. Just rather than having more and more people having to have channel access when it's not big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. Cheers. Thank you.